For um, second presenter today, I'm pleased to welcome Maury Silver. Uh, Maury's currently a senior at H.M. Fisher, a uh, member of the baseball team there, Tommy John survivor. And, uh, and uh, he's going to talk with you today about uh, better pitching through technology. Um, one of my goals with this talk is to help expose people to aspects of baseball that they might not be as comfortable with or as familiar with to uh, help with that. And I know a lot of people that come to these are more historical minded, so Maury is going to kind of help talk you through some of the cutting edge uh, technology that's uh, affecting how the game is being played today and uh, especially how a pitching team developed. So, uh, well, Ryan did a, did a great job at uh, introducing me. Here's a, here's a little background on me. Uh, this year, I actually served as our assistant bench coach uh, with the Red Wings. Um, so I worked with our players every day, and uh, that was a pretty cool experience. Um, as, uh, as Ryan said, I'm a St. John, St. John uh, Fisher College pitcher. Right now, I'm rehabbing from Tommy John surgery. <laughs> thanks to my, uh, my coaches in the back for, for taking time out of their schedules uh, for being here. And then, uh, also, I have a, a kind of, me and my buddy, uh, ben, who's back there, run a player development company uh, where named Silverdog, which looks at how to uh, develop players at a more efficient, uh, uh, an efficient rate. So um, I want to start off by just talking about how we share information. So whether this is coaches to players or players to players, um, we all do this through obviously word of mouth. Um, so when we talk about sharing information, it might be, uh, if we look at the example of how to throw pitches, how to throw certain pitches, um, we, uh, Mariano Rivera has his famous cutter. And so other pitchers, um, who obviously would like to have the same success that uh, he did, um, probably have asked him, uh, how do you throw that? Um, what do you think about it? How do you grip it? And so all of this information being, being passed on is based off uh, subjective uh, field data. Um, so it's all word of mouth, we're talking about how we do this, um, what to look at. Um, and then when we don't see another Mariano Rivera, we look at why this didn't work. Why didn't the information that is coming from a pretty reliable source, why did this didn't work? Um, so it's important to remember every player is unique. Um, everyone, uh, every player is going to have biomechanical uh, differences. So the difference in their, the length of the muscles in their arm, the length of their bodies in general. Um, so it's, you know, we got to look at each player um, and look at their own, uh, look at their own set of limits and abilities to determine uh, what, what the framework we're working with. So an easy, easy way to, to look at this and the obvious difference is you have a guy that's, that's a really uh, just a monster of a human being, right? And so we have to uh, be able to separate, you know, players based on, uh, just every individual and train, you know, Jose Altuve, who's a smaller guy. We have to tell him, and he has to use his body differently than, obviously, Aaron Judge or, or, or someone of a bigger statue. So, um, you know, we see this. We can see, obviously, one guy is a lot taller than the other, but this is also backed up by data. So when we look at data, we talk about pitchers. Um, each pitcher possesses their own unique uh, uh, metrics um, that's solely based off uh, who they are as a pitcher. Um, so now the question becomes, how do we collect that data? Um, what do we look at? How, like, what is this uh, that we're supposed to be differentiating players by? So we're going to look at a few, uh, a few different tracking systems that allow us to get into the, uh, the science of, uh, of each player. Um, so a couple tracking systems we're going to talk about is, uh, one is TrackMan. Um, we'll get into that. That's uh, you guys will probably be most familiar with that. Another is Rapsodo, um, and the third that we won't get too in depth on, um, but you should put it on your radars is Hawkeye. Hawkeye is the technology that tennis uh, uses. That when there's a replay or there's a challenge call, um, that's how we get those views. So um, we won't go too in depth on that, but that is something that Major League Baseball is um, actually going to put into place in these next couple. Of, uh, or these next coming years. So TrackMan, just to go back to TrackMan, if you've ever turned around and looked at the press box at Frontier Field, you'll see a black box. Um, and if you've ever wondered what that is, that is um, TrackMan. So TrackMan is a radar-based uh, tracking system. What it does is uh, it 
uses radar to capture all the movement uh, and metrics pertaining to the ball, whether it's thrown or hit. And then the one that we're really going to get a little in depth on is Rapsodo. So Rapsodo is this unit uh, over here. Uh, it's really not that big at all. It's probably the size of my laptop. Uh, and what it does is it sits in between home plate and the pitcher's mount. And so it is an optics-based uh, tracking system, which means it takes photos. So the pitcher releases the ball, it takes a photo, it takes that information from the photo and puts it into their algorithm and gives us every number we could ever think of. So this is what the user standing behind the mound um, is going to get. So we have everything from miles per hour, which is a pretty basic, uh, simple metric, to release angle and horizontal angle, which, you know, how can we look at all of this and, and, and make any changes, right? The pitcher's job is to throw the pitch, it's not to be a science major. So, you know, the, the big question arises is what do we look at? What are the most important things? So, I've kind of I've kind of narrowed it down to the core four. Um, you know, that there are, um, these are the most, the four most important uh, metrics to look like, or to look, to look at uh, when evaluating uh, a pitch. So you throw a pitch, we want to look at these four metrics. Uh, so, we'll look at velocity to, to uh, start off with. So velocity, obviously there's a premium based on, uh, on velocity. You guys all are pretty in tune with the game of baseball and we've seen um, a trend in the uptick of velocity. So within the past 10 years we've seen uh, the increase of velocity and the importance placed on developing velocity um, throughout Major League Baseball and, and obviously filtering down to uh, the college and youth leagues. So if we're going we're gonna to look at uh, four seam fastballs uh, within Major League Baseball. We see, obviously, in the past 10 years, a, a big uptick in velocity. So pretty basic velocity. That's, uh, that's nothing new to us. Something that is kind of becoming more mainstream is uh, spin rate. You might have seen uh, you know, spin rates becoming more and more uh, popular on TV broadcasts. It's like the new uh, kind of sexy metric that we're all starting to look at. Um, and so spin rate is just the total spin imparted on a pitch, uh, and it's measured in revolutions per minute. Your car engines are measured in revolutions per minute, so it's kind of the same idea. Um, so if we're going to look at the average spin rate on a fastball in Major League Baseball, um, it is 2200 RPM. So that's kind of like you can look at all other pitches, kind of grade on where uh, the average is. Um, so if we're going to talk about, you know, different pitches have different uh, characteristics of their own, but if we're going to look at a fastball, the lower uh, the spin rate, the more gravity can play on pulling that ball down. So if we have a low spin rate, gravity plays a bigger role in it, and so we see things uh, such as sinkers. Sinkers have a lower spin rate, the ball can be pulled down more. So we have a, a visual here. Um, the pitch on the left um, has a spin rate of 1500 RPM, and the pitch on the right has a spin rate of 27 RPM, 2700 RPM. If we're going to, so we're going to play this video and we'll see the difference in, um, so these balls will spin, they'll come together to, to show how they spread out. And as the balls travel towards home play, we can see that the pitch with the lower RPM was able to be affected by gravity uh, at a higher rate. And so this ball ends up lower than the pitch with the higher uh, spin rate. Uh, so, right, so just lower spin rate, it essentially sinks more and gravity can play a bigger role. The next thing we'll talk about is spin axis. So this one, this one's kind of uh, a little more, uh, you know, of the nitty gritty, but it's, it's uh, I think, the most important uh, aspect when it comes to movement. So, spin direction is a two dimensional axis of rotation of a pitch perpendicular to the direction of travel. So, whatever that means. <laughs> um, we can look at, so, you know, and that's, I joke about that, but when we talk to our players about this, they have no idea what that means either, you know? So it's like, it's important that we have these visuals, um, like the one I'm going to show to, um, you know, help them understand what they are doing. 
because the information is great, but it's only as useful as how we can, how effectively we can communicate that. So here's a visual. Um, we see that the halo, the blue halo, is pointing at the 12 o'clock. We call that a 12 o'clock uh, axis. Um, same thing, we shift the axis, now it's a 1 o'clock axis. We shift it again, 2 o'clock axis. And then finally, 3 o'clock. So this is all based on a, based on a clock uh, kind of visual. Um, so here's here's a uh, here's a basically one in action that we had a player throw, and then we were able to overlay this clock graphic that we have to explain to him what spin axis really is. So he goes to throw. And then, so his axis is a 120 axis. So if we're thinking about a clock, right? 120 is in between one and two, obviously. So we can see the, the faint, very faint blue uh, ring around the ball shows that its spin axis is in between the one and two o'clock. That's where we get the, one, uh, the 120 tilt, which is also just another name for spin axis. So we said that this is basically the single most important uh, factor in movement. And we can see, uh, you know, the difference, or we can see how that ball is affected by uh, by this spin axis. So it's spinning 120 spin axis, and then the ball moves mm -hmm. kind of in a sinker, uh, sinker uh, formation. <laughs> the kid that did not catch this is sitting in the back, <laughs> <laughs> and his thumb still might be broken. <laughs> All right, so, and he's going to kill me for saying that. So, uh, so the final thing that, the final metric we'll look at, um, if it's the final metric we'll look at, is vertical break. So vertical break, um, when we look at it, it's the deviation of where the ball crosses home plate um, compared to where it would have crossed home plate if there was no spin. So this next graphic we have here, um, we can see we have three balls. Um, we have, so if we stop this here, the ball on the top has the highest vertical break. There's the average vertical break and the lower vertical break. So the lower, um, hitters are accustomed to seeing the average, right? So they train, all their training is to the uh, average, right? So they're accustomed to seeing a average ball um, and their swings are patterned towards that. The lower vertical break um, is going to drop more. So we see pitches like sinkers, they drop more, they have a lower vertical break number. And as you can see, the ball, the lower vertical break ball, um, is dropping at a higher rate than uh, the others. So low vertical break, we want to, for guys that throw sinkers, they want to increase that as much as they can. And they'll have a, a more effective uh, sinker and the ball will drop more. So. To to kind of clear that up, we can look at uh, we can look at this this uh, visual. So we have this we have this uh, visual here. So these are we're going to talk about kind of the ranges of vertical break. So if you throw if your fastball has a vertical break below 12 inches, so this is a metric that that Rap Soto will tell you. And if it is below 12 inches, you are throwing uh, essentially a sinker, and so. Uh, below 12 inches of vertical break, the ball is deviating more than the average, and so it's creating more sink. And the hitter is, uh, you know, the hitter perceives that the ball is going to be one way, and it's actually dropping more. So they're unable to. Uh, there's more miss hits. There's more ground balls. Um, ground balls are miss hits that they're just hitting the top of it, or they're swinging over it. And then, if you, on the flip side, if we have high vertical break, the batter thinks the ball is going to be average, and the ball is actually. Uh, staying at a, on a, the same plane and dropping less. And so they're going to get miss hits under and they're going to swing under the ball. So it's important to, uh, to understand that the danger zone of where we don't want to be is average. Right? So hitters train every single day to hit average. So the further we can, we can uh, deviate from the average, the more uh, swing and misses we'll get, the more miss hits we'll get. Um, and so clearly, um, this is something that's pretty important to, uh, to pitchers. Um, 
it's also important to understand that if you throw 12 inches of vertical break, which is like a sinker, it's important to not throw up in the zone because um, you're going to sink right into a player's barrel. <laughs> so here we have the same, same idea, low vertical break, that ball is sinking the most, high vertical break has uh, essentially what we call uh, carry or rise. So to, to relay it back to, uh, to the real world, um, Garrett Cole, pitcher for the Astros, um, he pitches at the top of the zone and is pretty effective at pitching at the top of the zone. And some guys, uh, I mean, he just does it at a higher rate than anyone. And we're wondering why he, uh, why he has so much, so much success. Um, and so we look at his fastball, uh, his fastball vertical break number. He has above 18 inches of vertical break on his fastball. That's pretty much better than 99% of all uh, major league pitchers. So we call this carry because the ball is rising. It appears to be rising to hitters. On the flip side, we have someone, Zach Britton, pitcher for the Yankees, right? He throws sinkers. His vertical break number is below uh, nine inches. So he's able to get swings and misses over. He pitches in the bottom of the zone, uh, gets swings and misses over or ground balls. So that's why ground balls, uh, you hear the term ground ball pitcher or fly ball pitcher, that is directly correlated to vertical break. So if you're a fly ball pitcher, you have a high vertical break. If you're a ground ball pitcher, you have low vertical break. So a big thing uh, this summer that we, uh, you know, that I was involved in is looking at these numbers, but based on the uh, looking at opposing pitchers' numbers. Um, we have guys come in. We uh, uh, before the games, we sit down. We look at the opposing pitcher, uh, and we look at those movement charts or movement plots that we just looked at, uh, and we can better. Uh, tell our pitchers what, or tell our hitters what to look for. If he has a high vertical break uh, number, we know he's going to pitch in the top half of the zone. So now our hitters can approach that uh, they're at bat in a different manner than if they were sinker uh, guys that they now have to look down in the zone. So you know, and this is the way baseball is going. Is we know so much about ourselves, but it's how we can gain a competitive advantage uh, on the opposing team. So this is all great, you know, like we have all this information, um, you know, so what? Like what does it mean? Um, now it's time to take that data and put it into action, right? So we talk about developing players, we talk about, uh, you know, gaining that competitive effort. and it's only as useful as, as uh, if we can put it to use. Um, so something that, that helps us uh, put this data into, into action is actually slow motion cameras. So slow motion cameras, um, you know, they're used by all industries. NASA uses them uh, to look at their, you know, very quick movements of exhaust coming out of their, their spaceships. So pretty, you know, we're talking about baseball and then we're relating it to spaceships. It's kind of, you know, you wouldn't think that they're very comparable. Um, but the cameras and all this technology, we're able to slow everything down at an unbelievable rate. And so it gives us a better view of things that happen that the naked eye can't see. And so we're thinking about what can what happens uh, so quickly that we can't see uh, in life, and there's a lot of things. But one thing that I thought was interesting is uh, if we look at the popcorn kernel. Right, so we, we pop popcorn, we can't see the popping happening. Right, so it happens in a blink of an eye. I thought it was magic. Uh, so, and so using the same technology as we're using here, yeah, right. So using the same technology that we use here, we're able to look at, okay, this is what happens. These are the minute details that now give us a better picture of what's happening. So when your mom tells you it's magic, it's not really magic. <laughs> so relating it back to baseball, this is kind of where it comes into play. Um, so here's a video of what a pitch looks like in real, uh, goes, in real time. So this is the speed of a pitch in real time, right? His arm's obviously moving way too fast for us to make any changes. And all the coaches that tell you to make changes based off this, I mean, you must know something that I don't know. So this is obviously too fast to make any change. Their arm passes through way too fast. So now we use this technology that we have, um, and we're able to look at a lot of a lot of new things, right? So this is uh, this is now what we're able to see. 
So we look at, we can be, uh, we can line this back up, and we can be like, okay, well, his finger is coming off, off the ball like this. Is this good? Do we need to make a change? Um, are we going to, if we move uh, our fingers and how they come off the ball, are we going to increase the movement or are we going to decrease the movement? And so this is big, this is, you know, vital to, uh, to developing new pitches, to refining what we're doing already, um, and it just paints a better picture for the athlete. So something interesting that we look at is um, knuckleballs, right? Like, what actually is happening when we throw a knuckleball? They say it doesn't spin, but does it really spin? And it's just at a, at a very low rate. Um, so we're able to, one of our pitchers, uh, look at him throwing a knuckleball. So we drew a, we drew a uh, blue circle on it, just for frame of reference. But as we can see, that ball is not spinning at all. Uh, and that's why one, this is one of, uh, this is a pretty good knuckleball. But this is something that we wouldn't have been able to see if we didn't have this technology. So, we, uh, so now it's, a, it's about, we have the data, we have the numbers, um, and now we have the video. So, putting those two pieces together, we're really able to create um, just a better picture, and we're able to, to make faster changes, and that's the whole name of, name of the game here, is how can we gain a competitive edge, and if that's developing our players at a faster rate, and we're able to develop guys in double A and triple A to help our big league club, that's, that is uh, invaluable. So, basically, when we look at data and video, we're able to take the guesswork out of it. You know, no longer are we saying, well, I think it's because you're uh, cutting the ball, or your fingers are coming off the ball too early. I mean, my eyes aren't that good, so I wouldn't be able to tell you that. So we're taking the guesswork out of that. And because we're, we're making these changes, uh, and that these changes are driven by data, guys are more likely to buy into them because they know it's, in, it's written in cold hard fact, right? And it's not just some opinion of someone that you might not agree with. You can't disagree with data, so that's the big thing. Um, and then another thing is, you know, we might have a player that is very savvy, uh, with math, or he just has a very analytical mind that understands the numbers. And then we might have on the <coughs> flip side, someone who doesn't under, understand numbers at all, right? So being able to have, uh, you know, the numbers and the video to, to really put together a more complete picture, we're able to cater to each player and how their mind works uh, more specifically. Um, and at, at the end of the day, the, the only thing that matters and the reason why we do all this is to expedite development. We're able to just get our players better, and that's where it's uh, kind of overall for it's so great to see the game of baseball um, really embracing this and utilizing it because now overall on a grand scheme of things, we're going to be able to see better players, um, you know, come through and, and really improve the game of baseball. So something that we do um, is called pitch design. So we'll have a pitcher come in, uh, we have an athlete come in, and we establish a goal with them. We say, do you want to create a pitch from scratch that they've never thrown before, or do they want to refine a pitch? Like, for example, make their uh, curveball nastier. So we uh, establish, establish that goal, um, and then we let them throw. We collect their data, their numbers, we get their video, um, and then we sit down with them, and we go over a plan. Um, what do we want to do? What changes do we want to make? Um, and then we, uh, so that's the evaluating part, and then we go out there, we say throw again, and we execute those changes, and then it's like a, a wash, rinse, uh, repeat. Right, that's how you wash your hair? Yeah. Yeah, so, <laughs> <laughs> so and we just this, and the more, uh, the more effective we are with this, you know, we can see uh, changes made um, that used to take uh, months and off seasons to develop pitches, we can do in one or two sessions. So this is one of our pitch design labs. Um, as you can see, we have our athlete up there. We have the camera set up. Um, and then we have our monitors, right? So the cameras are hooked up to the monitors. This is real-time footage. So he throws a pitch. He can turn around, look at what he did uh, you know, uh, right away and see, OK, that one felt really good. What did I do on this one? Or that one felt really bad. What, did I, what do I need to fix? Um, and so being able to get that immediate feedback you know, everyone likes to say, um, you know, everyone's looking for immediate feedback, and it's true. Um, and we're able to make some, we're able to make some pretty, uh, you know, quick changes um, 
with our pitchers. And pitching is a pretty violent act, so if we can conserve our bullets and not waste our pitcher's arm, and we can make changes pitch to pitch rather than uh, bullpen to bullpen or practice to practice, that's pretty valuable. <coughs> so this is where, um, you know, it kind of, like I was saying, it gets really exciting uh, for baseball as, a, uh, as an industry and as a sport. Uh, we're, seeing, we're starting to see lower levels uh, of baseball being able to utilize this, uh, this uh, technology and these resources. So where it used to be the 30 major league teams had access to all this uh, information and technology, we're now seeing, well obviously the Red Wings are using it, so that's minor league baseball. And now even at uh, St. John Fisher, one of the things we do is uh, we use these exact systems. And um, I know that there's places that uh, youth developmental camps, so travel league teams are getting into this. So this is kind of like a broad, uh, a broad, uh, you know, sweeping, uh, you know, change that we're going to see better players at a higher rate. Um, the biggest challenge when that we start to face is just how well do we know this information? Anyone can throw money at the problem and buy every camera that there ever was, um, but it's you know how can we communicate uh, that information to our athletes? Um, so. Again, it's only as valuable as, as how much we, uh, we truly know. Um, and again, the result is just faster, more effective development for, uh, for athletes. So then we kind of get into the, um, you know, how do we, how do coaches, uh, or how do the, uh, the non-playing side react to this, you know? We see, we're seeing the coaching landscape change more than ever, and the people that, uh, adopt these systems are the ones that are, uh, you know, are getting the jobs. They're getting jobs that uh, we're seeing the college coaching, uh, you know, spectrum now getting big league opportunities because they are having. They tend to have more of a growth mindset, and they're not just relying on uh, their experience to get them jobs, uh, or that the fact that they played in pro baseball to get them jobs. Uh, so, and players, players understand that. Uh, this technology is out there, and they're wanting to learn uh, just want, just as much as anyone. So the fact that players know it's out there um, becomes really important when uh, we look at uh, trying to sign a free agent. So the reason why the Astros are are being uh, are having so much success with signing free agents is because players know they have this technology, and they're and they're uh, trying to invest in themselves by having uh, you know athletes. Uh, they're trying to develop them and, and get more bang for the buck, um, and it could further their careers. Um, and the same thing on the recruits level. You know, a kid's looking a, a looking for a college home. He wants to go to a place that's going to have, yeah, all the fun toys and whistles, but also a place that he knows he can grow and develop. Um, and then, so the big thing is, um, you know, technology. Um, we see in the workforce like AI is replacing a lot of jobs, um, and that can be. Um, scary to a lot of a lot of people and coaches that are very anti-data and that very anti-technology kind of have the same mindset. But you know where you can look at it from that angle, we like to say that it empowers our coaches. Our coaches are now able to take uh, information and better service our players because they know that their gut feel, which is now backed up by data, uh, is is you know the best way to serve their players, and they're able to tell them their players more accurate information. So that's uh, that's pretty much it. Within the context of your elbow injury, is there yeah. any application here for injury prevention? And can you touch on that a little bit? If there is. So yes, um, we could have gotten into. We talked about biomechanics a little bit. So one of the ways that I'm actually rehabbing is I wear this. Uh, this sleeve that basically calculates the, uh, it has a sensor in it, it calculates the amount of torque on your elbow. Mm -hmm. So now instead of where it used to be, go throw 10 pitches at 20 feet, well, I might need more effort to throw 20 feet than you might need to throw at 20 feet. So, um, yeah, if there's just, you know, there's a, teams are investing in biomechanics labs <coughs> now to get a better picture of their players. It's just, <coughs> It's really uh, a never-ending, you know, are there, the limits are endless. You know? Have we discovered like a correlation between like arm release angle and injury or, or velocity or anything? You know? 
Well, so something that we have learned is uh, in practice, um, a lot of pitchers uh, like to throw flat ground. So what flat grounds are, are uh, you get into the same pitching motion, but it's off grass. It's not off a mound. And so we, we were able to tell the, uh, through biomechanic research, we were able to see that there's more stress when throwing on a flat surface as compared to an angle, which, which is a mound. So something we do at Fisher now and something that we tend to do is we've completely uh, gotten, rid of, gotten rid of those because we don't see the benefit of uh, induced torque or increase in torque on our elbows for a very minimal Given it would, or seems to be the increase in injuries to pitchers' arms, is this is the technology so new? That, this may be an observation more than a question. Is the technology so new that we don't know if it's really something that's going to reduce those arm injuries or something that maybe exacerbates making it worse? The well, data is so new. Right. You know. But with the data, we're able to do a lot more in a lot less time. Mm -hmm. So we're able to, uh, like for example, now when I go to throw uh, and I do a pitch design session, mm -hmm. where I would think, oh, I gotta, I gotta throw 100 pitches to get this down. Mm -hmm. Repetition, repetition. But we actually know now that uh, that actually the way your brain works isn't by repetition. And we also know that we have all this data and video. We can get uh, that done in about 20 pitches. Mm -hmm. So. Mm -hmm. Where the increase in arm injuries are coming in from is probably not the same areas of where this advanced technology is coming in. Mm -hmm. You know, so what we we know a lot. You know, we know a lot more, and the people that understand the the new uses of technology are there to better service their athletes. So we know uh, how much stress we're putting on the elbows. We're able to manage workload by the amount of stress you're putting on your elbow, not the amount of Throws you're doing, you know. So it's more. Uh, so ultimately, in, in that in the near future, with an, I don't know how big of a sample you get, should they show that injuries are being reduced? That you would right. Think. Right. Well, it depends how many of these uh, facilities that have this new technology. Mm -hmm. How how many can those facilities service? How many players? So, on the unfortunate side is most facilities don't do this, mm -hmm. and they are going off their gut feel of what this parent's uh, dad who played in a men's league thinks, mm -hmm. right? Whereas, uh, you know, the really good facilities, if you take where the really good facilities are, are uh, producing and the athletes are producing, I'm sure you'd have to think that their injury rate is going down. Mm -hmm. So. Uh, you talked mostly about pitching as far as this technology is concerned. Yeah. But in the, in the beginning, you showed that uh, there's a zone where the pitches come in an average, and this is where all the hitters practice. Right. Uh, I understand practicing striking a ball. Just recently, I've heard that uh, the best baseball players, the best hitters, have uh, an advantage because their eyesight is 2012 as opposed to a normal 2020. Uh, and you do hear when they're announcing on TV that hitters are recognizing the spin and the, and the rate to recognize what kind of pitch is coming in their second or half second. <laughs> they right, can make right. that decision. And the, the basis of my question is that if that's all true, the most frustrating thing I see is these guys swinging at pitches that land uh, six feet in front of the plate, you know, and all that. <laughs> Right. And you wonder, why the hell, if they have this opportunity, or if they have this eyesight, uh, do they train hitters also to look at pitches coming out of a hand to pick up a spin rate? Right. Do they really do that, or is this all uh, something that's being fed to us, you know? Well, partly, <laughs> because we actually know through, uh, through research being done that no human is able to pick up spin coming out of the hand. So it actually, there was actually a, a study being done um, using uh, looking at how the eyes work, um, and that it actually is a result of your brain doing things that your mind or that you consciously have no idea. So you're picking up things that uh, whether it's the way their body is oriented, all these kind of things, 
but they're not able to pick up spin. So, you know, when you're, uh, that kind of goes into approach. So when you go into uh, an at-bat, uh, the more advanced hitters have one pitch they're looking for, right? They might be looking for a fastball in this situation or a curveball, and that better, uh, you know, gets their mind prepared for, okay, I'm looking for a fastball here, and on the flip side, the pitcher is trying to make everything look the same until the last possible moment, which then the hitter, it's past the hitter's, uh, you know, brain process to make a decision. Or they time. Need to right. <laughs> you just don't right. have time to, right. to stop a, a swing that uh, all of a sudden the ball's disappearing. Right, right. So, so seeing a, a spin uh, of the ball from the pitcher, you're, you're saying that these guys are... Right, yeah, we, we, know, we know that that's, that is not, that's not possible. But the, what they can pick up is, uh, on a fastball, the ball might not, uh, or on a curveball, sorry, it might pop out of their hand a little bit. Mm -hmm. So yeah. that little distinct, that little distinct pop, or the uh, hump in the ball, they can recognize that. Yeah, that's, that's, that's what they call uh, telegraphing no. their pitch. Right, it's, right. It's where the arm location and that kind of thing is. Right, yeah. exactly. So, so batters are not training to look for a ball that's going to drop out of the strike zone. Right. They that's, might be looking down, and if they know based on what the pitch does, on a, the, what the usual pitch does, they might be looking at a certain zone, but they're not they're not picking up spin and then able to, you know. Yeah, because they, they look pretty foolish swinging at right. those pitches. Right. <laughs> and this and the pitch design aspect of this is yep. um, going to increase that. You know, pitchers have the unique uh, spot of, um, you know, controlling what happens, right? So if we're able to control what happens, we can make, uh, we're able to train for it a lot differently and instead of where the hitters are coming from a reaction uh, standpoint. I have a question. You talked about about uh, how you can use, uh, say, Rap Soto to work with an individual player. Mm -hmm. and I'm wondering what kind of uh, data sharing goes on, say, throughout a minor league organization or even through all of baseball to help you learn lessons. Um, is, is that largely proprietary data, or are there bodies of data where you can look at and say, hey, this is the, these are the guys with the best fastballs, and that this is how they produce them? So yeah, so that's actually something that's uh, ever changing. You know, a few years ago, everything was proprietary, um, but now as uh, all this technology is becoming more and more available, um, we're able to look at someone in the uh, Houston organization and look at their spin <coughs> rates, and, and that's how we uh, scout against our pitchers. Um, but as far as um, yeah, I mean, we're just able to. I'm sure there's some that are still proprietary numbers that as the new technology comes into play um, will be shared throughout baseball. Um, but to the outside world of not being in an organization, there's definitely a lot fewer numbers that you can get access to. So two questions. One I think is sensible, the other one's not. But the first one is when the Red Wings are scouting for a pitcher who's going to come and pitch here against them, mm -hmm. where do they get their data from previous games they've pitched? And if they've never pitched for the Red Wings before, is it just scouts or what? So the way that works is now with all this technology, we're able to um, essentially tap into a database that all teams have. Um, and so when we're scouting against a, a tomorrow's uh, starter, um, we pull numbers from this database um, that everyone has access to. So it's, uh, you know, where it used to be, you had to have someone watch, go watch the game. That's kind of, you know, it's kind of obsolete now. So. My, other, yeah, my other question is to share that. Why does the AI guy say calculate instead of calculate? Because they should just share it and just put it out there. Can you trust the statistics of a guy they hired who says that? <laughs> Listen, <laughs> it'll drive you nuts once you see it. <laughs> Sorry. That's funny. Now, I don't know. That's a good question right there. Or you've given me a completely new way to look at pitching for that, I thank you. But when I look at this, I would think the effectiveness of any pitcher is the variance between pitches. 
right. In other words, if I'm facing a Mike Musina or a Jim Palmer or Bob Gibson, right. this fastball may do one thing, this curve may do something else. Um, but my question is, now that we've reached this stage of analytics, now instead of just worrying about a fastball from Bob Gibson, is it coachable? Is a variance coachable? So in other words, you talked about um, you know, the spin rate and the spin uh, axis. Right. Is it possible to teach a pitcher to throw a fastball at 2200 RPM with a one o'clock spin axis, but teach the same pitcher to throw at 1500 RPM with a two o'clock axis or whatever? In that way, now not only do I have to worry about whether he's throwing me a fastball or a curveball, but how much variance there is in the fastball he's going to throw me, for example. Right, that so that's the, that's the big question right now is how do you uh, train for spin rate, and you can't. Right now we don't know that you can uh, you know, change your spin rate enough to where you can throw on one end of the spectrum and the other. So what we do is we have, um, although we don't know how to train for spin rate, we do know how to uh, alter uh, things to make small adjustments, whether that be if you're in that middle range, well, now what do we do? Is it easier to drop you to uh, having a lower vertical break or a lower spin rate or increase your spin rate? Um, and that's where this gets a little interesting is uh, pine tar is used by pitchers, right? And that, you didn't hear that from me. That increases spin rate. So that is one way to increase, um, you know, certain numbers that we can't really train for and we don't really know. Um, but there's studies going on right now um, that look at if we strengthen, uh, if we put a pitcher on a 10-month finger strengthening program, is that going to increase his spin rate? And it's cr there's some crazy things going on just because we don't know. We don't know how to, and the person and the team that does know how to do it is definitely not going to tell anyone, and they're probably going to be at a competitive advantage. Because like your thing with Garrett Cole is right. that his, his four seamers, right. They all seem to be in that same range. Right. What kind of pitcher would he be as if he could have two different ranges? Right. If you can well, teach him that. Is that the future, do you think, in, in coaching or I think the you know, where this really becomes a uh, where coaches have a lot of value in it is you know, taking okay, he does that really well. His fastball is elite, right? You categorize it as elite. Now it's how can we play off of that and throw maybe a different pitch? And spread the ranges, uh, and make well spread the ranges, but throw a fastball, and then develop a curveball that looks exactly like his fastball until the latest possible second. And it, you know that's where it's like, do we, uh, you know, how do we do that? You know, ways to manipulate the ball. And then as far as when you were saying spin axis, that's something that we do change. We have uh, like a lot of guys that are have low vertical break numbers. We tell them to shift it down towards three o'clock in order to get more sync. So then it goes into there's two different kinds of forces that have impact on the ball, and it's kind of a rabbit hole to go down. Um, but that is one of the most common uh, changes that we do make is where they uh, the ball or the axis of which they throw the ball. So is it safe to say that what we've learned today is the difference between Larry Rothschild? Yeah. And this guy from Cleveland that the Yankees are talking about. Right, that, that, and that's the big thing is, um, you know, obviously, I have the I come from the Twins, so you know who knows what's going on over there. But that's the big thing is, um, you know, either you're kind of with it or you're not. You know, and a lot of our coaching turnover and at uh, at the ballpark here was probably because of that. You know, um, there's so many bright minds. Uh, like the Astros, the Astros had hired uh, a guy from NASA, right, to be one of their front office members. So, I mean, the game's the game's changing. Where 20 years ago, if you didn't play pro ball, you were not, you were buying a ticket to get to the game, you know. So, but kind of a silly question, but this this whole concept of controlling the ball, what kind of impact is it having on the accuracy of Calling the game. I'm surprised Blaze didn't say the first bunnies in blue, but you know, the umpires have got to be challenged by these. Yeah, yeah, the, 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 the talk about. 
people like chronic right. home right. Oh, yeah. Well, when you make pitches nastier, they're going to be a little tougher to, to call, right? Um, that kind of gets into the side of pitch framing. So it has more to do with the catchers um, than the pitchers, but it is, it is uh, you know, umpires go through the same scouting reports on their own kind of level of, okay, this guy's going to throw these pitches, I have to make sure that I hang in there. So I'm you're not, getting some kind of trade. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. And they review everything just as much as players do. So. There you go. Thank you very much for it.